In our last video, we looked at genetics, and I gave you a basic introduction to the concepts. In this video, we're going to look at domestication, and I'm going to do something similar. I'm just going to give you a basic introduction to the concept. Welcome to the Art of Breeding with Brian Reeder. To begin, I'm going to read to you the basic definition of domestication from Wikipedia. Domestication is a multi-generational mutualistic relationship in which an animal species, such as humans or leafcutter ants, take over control and care of another species, such as sheep or fungi, to obtain from them a steady supply of resources, such as meat, milk, or labor. The process is gradual and geographically diffuse based on trial and error. Domestication affected genes for behavior in animals, making them less aggressive. In plants, domestication affected genes for morphology, such as increasing seed size and stopping the shattering of cereal seed heads. Such changes both make domesticated organisms easier to handle and reduces their ability to survive in the wild. Okay, that's, that's a pretty good definition of what it is, what domestication is. It's limited. Obviously, it's just a short paragraph, so it's not going to go into great depth into what it is. There's a little bit more to it. Um... I have always been deeply fascinated by the the functioning of, of this process of domestication. Um, I grew up on a farm. I was surrounded by domestic animals and plants from, from earliest childhood. So it's something that I was aware of. And because I had gotten encyclopedias young and I started reading up on things quite young... I had come upon the concepts of domestication and that the chickens and the cattle and the dogs and the corn and the beans and these things that I was familiar with were domesticates. That is to say, they had originated from a wild progenitor that through the process of domestication that is, humans bringing them into captivity and selecting toward more and more useful traits these had been changed from the wild species into the domestic animals with the many animals and plants with the many breeds and varieties that we know in the modern day it was very interesting to me because i was just obsessed with these plants and animals but also obsessed with this whole concept that these things had been manipulated and changed and that, for instance, the in those days, we thought the red jungle fowl had given birth to all the breeds of chickens. And it's true, the red jungle fowl is the major progenitor, but they're not the only progenitor. They are not the sole progenitor species. And chickens, in fact, are hybrids. However, other domesticates are not hybrids and do descend from a single species that was domesticated. Now, also quite early, I ran across the writings of Charles Darwin, specifically The Origin of Species, and that further introduced to me, sealed the deal, I guess you could say, with my obsession with domestication. It was domestication and the domesticated animals upon which Darwin based his theory of the origin of species and the process of evolution. That gave rise in our time you know, after Darwin and into our time, to the concept that breeds of animals were equivalent to species. And that's not true. Breeds are simply stable genetic combinations. Because of the information that I had encountered when reading Darwin, I was primed to be thinking about domestication. In the 70s and 80s, when I was a uh, young kid and then on into being a teenager. I was breeding fish. I was interested in garden plants. I ran across the book Daylilies by A.B. Stout. I ran across the book Peonies, uh, I believe it's The Peonies, by A.P. Saunders, who created the garden peony as we know it now, the hybrid herbaceous and hybrid tree peonies. A.B. Stout created the hybrid garden daylilies. I ran across these books that they had written and I began to read about how they originated these garden plants 
and they had hybridized uh, a a B Stout had hybridized the species of daylilies to make garden daylilies. A P Saunders had used the uh, fairly ancient and already domestic forms of the Fruticosa tree peony and the Lactiflora, which is an herbaceous peony from China. These were already highly selected varieties that had been grown in gardens for hundreds, uh, maybe even thousands of years. So he took those that came from China and began hybridizing them with various wild species of peony. And through that he created the modern hybrid herbaceous peonies. So as I then kept fish like angelfish and guppies and discus, I was seeing that this was the early phases of domestication too. Angelfish at that time had a few mutations. You know, there were black and half black and gold and blushing and leopard and a few things like that. There were veil tails. Guppies had, were a little older. They had been kept for a little more time. So there were already, you know, delta tails and long tails and, you know, all of the, uh, not all that we have now, but a lot of fancy things were already established in guppies. I was keeping goldfish, but those were ancient ancient domesticates. Those have been domesticated in ancient China. So I knew from the goldfish and from what I'd read with Darwin and, and what I understood about the domestication of the farm animals and plants, that what I was seeing in these other fish species was the beginning of domestication. And then in the 19, uh, in, in my teens, I started keeping snakes and I started to encounter the various morphs like the amelanistic corn snake or the anorithristic corn snake. And I began to see, okay, this is domestication too. These are being domesticated. I already had the concept that what domestication is, is bringing something into captivity and then selecting for desired traits. Now, with our ancestors, those desired traits were food and clothing and utility. But in these modern domestication events, whether it was daylilies or peonies or angelfish or guppies or discus or the various snakes that morphs were beginning to appear in, these were being selected for aesthetic they were being kept as pets or as garden plants, and they were being selected for the aesthetic. So it was not exactly the same. It was not being selected for the same purposes, but it's still domestication. Now, in time, I would go on and look at domestication much more in depth, but I want to stress that all through my childhood and into my teens and into my 20s, I was fascinated by domestication, and this was always something uppermost in my mind. I always knew that you could take something from the wild and select within a population and make changes that would lead to domestication. What really turned things around for me, though, was that in the late 90s, I ran across a body of research that had been done by Dmitry Balyev, I believe is how his name's pronounced, I don't speak Russian, who had been doing research with fur foxes in Russia. He would go to these uh, fur fox farms, and he would select amongst the young, the, they're called kits, amongst the baby foxes. And the way he selected was he would put his hand on them, and the ones that were calm were the selected ones, and the ones that were aggressive were the ones that went for fur. They were discarded, so they were not selected for his program. So the ones that he selected over just a few generations, he was able to reach a point where he had these very calm, very friendly, very human-adapted foxes that basically were domestic. But what's really interesting is what he found is once he got them to this point where they were calm and tame and friendly... Other changes happened along the way that he was not selecting for initially. And that was basically um, changes to color, like piebald coloring. In other words, they would get white spots, a very common thing we see in domestic animals. The, cur the tails would curl, so instead of having a long straight tail like you see in the adult population of the normal wild fur fox, they would have curled tails. And he also saw traits that are neoteny. Neoteny is where an adult maintains the characteristics of the juvenile. So he saw neoteny. He saw shorter legs. He saw shorter faces and shorter skulls. He saw bigger eyes, smaller, more compact bodies. The curled tail, he believed, also was neoteny. His work was extremely fascinating, and it re led to research on these um, foxes that showed 
when actual um, testing was done on them, you know, through lab testing, that the changes were to the adrenal glands, which partial adrenal function was turned off in these calmer individuals. And also the serotonin levels in the brain had changed, which means they were friendlier. And both of these changes led to a friendly, calm, human-adapted animal that did not have a flight or fight response like wild animals do. So it's now known that those same genetic changes have occurred in all the domestic animals because humans were always selecting the calmer ones that is calmer with humans, for the most part, and not always. I mean, there's some variation. There are mean bulls in some breeds of cattle. There are aggressive chickens that will attack you. There are chickens that were used for fighting that still have aggression with each other. So domestication is not a, um, a one and done. It's levels. There are multiple mutations that can affect the serotonin levels and can affect the level of adrenal function. But all domestic animals have some version and some level of this. And interestingly, humans have it too. Because as we domesticated plants and animals, we were also domesticating ourselves. This research is very interesting. If you're, if you're interested in looking into the research that Dmitry Balyev did, there's a book called How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog. It's by Lee Allen Dugatkin. Again, don't speak Russian. Um, I have the book. It's excellent. Um, but this introduced me to the concept that just selection for calmness is all it takes. Selection for calmness will create the situation where the other mutations then begin to happen in a crew. And so once you begin selecting for all of these things, that's where you begin to move into breeds. This is interesting because when we look at like the example of, of snakes or angelfish or uh, whatever, you know, whatever animals that have recently been brought from the wild and are now being kept as pets, there are morphs and they're being selected. The selection's a little different in them because they're not necessarily being selected for calmness. Some snake breeders will select for the calmer animals, and that's a good thing to do. Some don't. Um, so I question to what extent that's going to influence the domestication that's happening in snakes. Because, make no mistake, what's going on in snakes right now is a form of domestication. What's going on in any of these animals where you've brought them out of the wild and you've put them into captivity and you're breeding them in captivity and they're you're providing their food, th you, you know, you're deciding who they're mating with for the most part, you are beginning domestication. And I know some people want to think that they're doing preservation or conservation when they're keeping these animals but the very unless you're bringing in gene flow from wild stock every generation or two or three at the most and unless you're setting up situations where they have to forage for themselves and they have to face predation and they have to deal with all the situations they would face in the wild you are changing them by the very nature that they're no longer in competition with nature they're no longer fighting for their lives and learning how to source their own food and hide from predation. This is a thing then to consider if you are breeding snakes and you've just finally gotten with the program and accepted that you're doing domestication, go ahead and start really selecting for temperament. You know, it's something that I say in chickens, for instance, there's different levels. There are breeds of chickens that will attack you. There are breeds of chickens that are extremely calm. I always say that the only true full domesticates in chickens are the Asiatics like the, um, like the, the Cochin or the Langshan or the Brahma. Um, which derive from older Chinese breeds like the Nine Caddy Buff, which when they were imported were called things like Chittagongs and Cochin Chinas that we then bred up what we call Cochins and Brahmas and Lanshan from. They were highly selected. And what's interesting with them is that in ancient China, there was uh, instituted a policy of state-run poultry breeding facilities. And so they were trying to produce maximum meat and maximum eggs in these facilities. And they instituted a program where they would call out the most aggressive because the calmer birds produce more eggs, they produce larger bodies, that thus more meat, and you had to have a situation where you could keep multiple males together, so you wanted to reduce male-on-male -male aggression. That kind of selection for a specific purpose 
inadvertently was co- selecting for more and more of these adrenal function changes that created the most domestic of all the chickens, which are those large fowl breeds that, that we now know in the West as Cochins and Brahmas and Lanshans, and which have equivalents still in China and other parts of Asia. So it's an extremely interesting thing. And I also find, I want to stress here as we're closing, because I've, I want to keep this one fairly short, um, domestication can occur within a single species or from a hybridization event. And we'll look at that more in the next one. But domestication is an endlessly fascinating subject. If you're keeping something in captivity, if you're making hybrids, but even if you're not, if you're selecting for changes of any kind, especially if you're cha- selecting for morph changes where you're seeing different phenotypes, in other words, like mutations toward albinism or changes of flower color from the wild forms, any kind of changes you select for, you're domesticating. And that's what domestication is. Thank you for visiting my channel. I hope this video was interesting to you. If you would like to know more about this subject, leave a comment or question below in the comments section. Please leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell notification to be alerted when new videos post. You can find my poultry books on Amazon at the link below in the show notes. My daylily website, sundragondaylilies.com, offers information on booking me for consultations on your specific genetics questions or mentoring for your breeding projects. It also lists all of my daylily introductions, the cultivars that are currently available, and links to my blog where you can find the bulk of my daylily writing. Thank you for joining me for this video, and I hope you'll be back for more. Have a great day.